Thanks for tuning in to another installment of Advanced TV Herstory, a podcast that studies, analyzes, and celebrates women in television. Among thousands of comedies, variety shows, and dramas that have aired, the presence of strong women, both in front of and behind the camera, hold valuable lessons. In some cases, good shows or characters of today can be traced to an influence that aired 20, 30, even 40 years ago. With an eye to aligning the leadership lesson, time capsule observation, or fascinating backstory of a show's success or failure, my goal of advanced TV history is to connect the treasures of the past to the great potential of today's TV and online platforms. Theme songs that prompt a smile, characters that make you want to stand a little taller, shows that defy social norms or expectations of how women should behave, it's all here in advanced TV history. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. If this is your first listen to Advanced TV Herstory, welcome. If you're a regular listener, thank you. This podcast is gaining momentum in all sorts of ways. The most important, you ask? Feedback from listeners. Selecting a theme or topic for an installment is no small feat. But a longtime favorite TV show that mainly featured men was voiced by one listener as significant to her and her law school classmates. Last month, a listener wrote in about Hill Street Blues. Quote, The show was on when I was in law school. Veronica Hamill's character had a major influence on us. She was attractive, professional, witty, in control. This was one of the first times I recall seeing an older woman who was seriously attractive and sensual. Hamill, I think, served as the role model for later attorneys on shows like Law & Order. Where the idea of female lawyers who dressed as tarts came from? I have no idea. Thanks for the feedback. And um, as a result of this idea to focus in on Veronica Hamill and Hill Street Blues, that's what today's installment is all about. Advanced TV Herstory loves to take a second look at an ensemble show and showcase those women characters if indeed they are truly showcase worthy. Hill Street Blues is indeed showcase worthy in that its first season alone garnered an incredible number of Emmy Awards and nominations. It was a quality, groundbreaking series developed by Stephen Bochco and hatched out of the Mary Tyler Moore TV empire. What, you ask? Mary Tyler Moore had or has a TV empire? Well, yes, of sorts. It's a very cool story that helps explain so much about TV programming for that important decade between the mid-70s and the mid-80s. We're talking about shows like the obvious ones, such as The Mary Tyler Moore Show, Rhoda, Lou Grant, and Phyllis, as well as Bob Newhart. But Hill Street Blues, St. Elsewhere, and others also fall into the category of a production from MTM. The business enterprise, as well as the actress, will be the subject of a future installment of Advanced TV Herstory. You know it. But I digress. So, back to Hill Street Blues, a series that aired on NBC from 1981 to 1987. Set in a neighborhood police precinct, which was urban and diverse. It featured an ensemble of actors who were accomplished, but none were stars in their own right when they first signed on to Hill Street Blues. But by the end of the show's run, they needed to dedicate an entire room for award trophies. Across all categories, the show, its crew, and cast were recognized for outstanding work. Hill Street Blues holds some significant Emmy records, including sharing the number of wins for an outstanding drama series, four, with uh, these latecomers, Mad Men, L.A. Law, and The West Wing. It holds the most nominations for supporting actor and actress in a drama series, 16 for the men and 13 for the women. That's a powerful statement about the acting caliber of the women, given the fact that actors outnumbered actresses in the series at least four to one. Of those Emmy nominations for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Drama Series, Betty Thomas was the only member of the cast to be nominated in every season of the show. Thomas won the award in 1985 for her portrayal of Lucy Bates. Though nominated a number of times, Veronica Hamill never won for her lead actress work as Joyce Davenport. This was a show unlike any other to have aired. Yes, there had been cop shows, but the production, pace, and camera work approached storytelling style in a precinct the same way the makers of ER brought a new look to the medical drama. 
And in 1981, it contained within this large ensemble cast issues of race, poverty, police pressures, and political plots. Two women stood out as role models. Joyce Davenport, public defender, was played by Veronica Hamill, and officer and later sergeant Lucy Bates, played by Betty Thomas. The show is lauded as one of the first to use a handheld camera to enhance the realism of the set. Among women of a certain age, it is remembered and treasured as presenting the first serious woman lawyer in a regular role, Joyce Davenport, and a uniformed, competent police officer, Lucy Bates. How important were these performances that stretched over 146 episodes? According to the Russell Sage Foundation, the number of women who were pursuing and graduating with advanced degrees or professional degrees in medicine, dentistry, and law reached 13,000 annually in 1979 and 1980. That capped a very rapid growth of the 1970s. The National Center for Education Statistics data, as presented by the Russell Sage Foundation, shows that even through the mid-2000s, not that long ago, the annual number of graduates seems to have tapered off to around 20,000. Can one attribute the momentum of women enrolling in and completing professional degrees to the women's movement and TV characters? Sure, since there is no right answer as to the cause and effect. But you can look to the strength of the imagery and the conversation of the, of the day. The students of these advanced degree programs would have been in grade school and junior high when Title IX was enacted. And in a sense, they were the first beneficiaries of the educational opportunities created and protected by that landmark legislation. So in 2015, when longitudinal statistics point to a paucity in credible female role models in professions on TV, should we be concerned? Yes, we should. Some would argue that 2015 isn't 1985. We've evolved. TV and its leading shows don't have nearly the impact on teenagers as they did 30 years ago. Young people today, young women of today, seek out their entertainment from all sorts of sources. Well, yes, but young women are also smart enough to know that the show Two Broke Girls, which has no women writing, directing, or producing it, really isn't intended to be aspirational for young women in any way. This is not a show they see themselves in. And it's slim pickings these days among network dramas, comedies, and especially reality shows for any resemblance of a credible, believable, aspirational role for young women. They're there, and we celebrate them, but there's not enough of them. So, getting back to Hill Street Blues, which also was a show largely written, directed, and produced by men. The characters of Joyce Davenport and Lucy Bates were huge and deserve more attention. There's one more woman character in the show who merits honorable mention, and I'll briefly describe who she was and who played her. Actress Barbara Bossen played Faye Ferrillo, the wife and ex-wife of Precinct Captain Frank Ferrillo. In the context of the 70s, the character of Faye represented the sand shifting below the feet of so many women. A stay-at-home mother of one who generally relied on her overworked husband for problem-solving and emotional support Faye's timing for entering the precinct was remarkable. Most episodes contained at least one appearance by Faye. Her crises and dilemmas generally seemed trivial compared to the gritty drama unfolding in the precinct or on the streets, but they did serve to present a fuller picture of police families' work-life balance. Nominated for an Emmy for her efforts, Bossen played the vulnerable but honest Faye impeccably throughout the series' run, and was able to evolve the character to one who contributed to the victim side of crimes investigated by the police officers in the precinct. Bossen's character of Faye also provided the perfect setup for her husband, or now ex-husband, Frank's midlife wanderings. From the first episode, viewers understand there's a quiet romance brewing between Frank and Joyce. Hill Street Blues didn't go home with many of the characters, but Frank and Joyce were the saucy exception. In the 20 years of primetime programming that preceded Hill Street Blues, 
There had never been a woman lawyer as consistently powerful as Joyce Davenport. Many powerful lady lawyers followed her, for instance, Anne Kelsey, played by Jill Eikenberry, and Grace Van Owen, played by Susan Day. Uh, these are all L.A. law characters, if you're following along. Michelle Green as Abby Perkins and Amanda Donahoe's C.J. Lamb. All L.A. law. And that was a show, though, that aired from 1986 to 1994. So basically, there was a bit of a, a, a one-year overlap between Hill Street Blues and L.A. law. But I think it, if you put the two shows together, you see some significant progress. So think of the progress from Veronica Hamill being a well-heeled public defender among a sea of men in gritty, urban, kind of like a New York. To the upscale, private sector, well-paid salaries pulled down by these equally intelligent, hard-working women. I'd call that progress. And other shows from that period and, and years later that featured memorable women lawyers were Damages, Boston Legal, and law and order of all flavors. While it's reported that the role of Joyce was originally written for a blonde with strong physical endowments, by the time Veronica Hamill auditioned, they got a look at a strength and a calm that fit the side of the show that was serious, not the light workplace humor side, which also ran alongside each and every episode. Uh, for me, out of the most humiliating experience came the most wonderful experience. I had left town to do a play, and I had seen the script for Hill Street Station, it was called then. Or I hadn't seen it, I had heard about it. So I went off to do the play, and they fired my ass in five days, and I was back. The worst experience of my life. Humiliating, you think, I'll stay in bed forever, I can't act. No, can't do it. My agent, bless him, John Gaines, when he was still alive, he said, I've got this script still, and I'm sending it over. They are testing two people. It's down to the wire. I want you to read this. And I had met Stephen in the hallway, and I didn't want to do a series, but I just wanted to get out of bed from that awful place you go to and thought, no, I need to do this for my self-esteem and get out there. He said, come on, come on down and, and read. I said, no, no, I just wanted to come and meet you tell you I think it's wonderful and I'm, I'm, I just wish you well. No, 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 come in, come in. Anyway, uh, I read and I left and they called that day and wanted an answer, would I do it? And uh, of course you just said yes. With striking black hair pulled back, Hamill delivered style of professionalism that elevated her public defender role above the grittiness of being a public employee. Her wardrobe, manners, and vocabulary revealed a breeding and socioeconomic background that told the viewer she was there because she wanted to serve the indigent and defend those wrongly accused, not because she had to. So unique, so special, and Davenport, I thought, my God, this isn't a thing. All right, Perillo, I want him She's an officer of the court. She's a grown woman. The lady to... She has integrity. She doesn't use her petticoat and curtsy constantly with authority figures and her man. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how wonderful. Joyce voices ethical and moral questions of the day as she serves the very people, the police officers, we follow, arrest, and charge. Brutality, evidence, transparency, this was headline fodder in the real life and public defenders upheld the standards applied to the middle-class defendants for their own. In fact, Michigan State University law professor Joan Horwath provides an extensive study of women defense attorneys on TV. Her article, entitled Women Defenders on Television, Representing Suspects and the Racial Politics of Retribution, analyzes character tra traits of the fictional lawyers with women attorneys she surveyed. Horwath looks in-depth across a number of shows and characters to reveal motivation for serving as a public defender or criminal defense attorney and the acts of heroism or advocacy that are part of representing that which is unpopular or that who is unpopular. To aid those accused takes a certain strength and conviction, as well as intelligence, for it requires her to act in a way that a heinous or brutal character so unworthy, it would seem, should not be locked up for a crime. This is not a popularity contest. 
Horwath's scholarly work from 2000 was published in the Journal of Gender, Race, and Justice. As she asserts, quote, television is important because culture is important. We understand ourselves and our world through the images and concepts available to use through our culture. That says an awful lot, not only about women defenders in television, but about the mission of advanced TV history. So again, I'm just going to repeat that because it's a, it's a very heady sentence. Television is important because culture is important. We understand ourselves and our world through the images and concepts available to use through our culture. We all know a bit about the law, medicine, TV, news production, and running ocean liners, hotels, vineyards, and ranches from watching TV. Apart from Joyce Davenport's professional side, Hamill projected a sophisticated, sensual aura that reminded viewers that she was not all business. Falling into bed with Ferrillo after a hard day in court, her sleepwear was as classy as her sharp red bow ties, dark suits, trench coat, mink coat, and white blouses. Watch for one episode in season six where she's even glamorous wearing a gray sweatshirt and sweatpants and her hair is up in a pink towel. Because Hill Street Blues was a large ensemble show and the character of Joyce Davenport is an outlier to the major storylines, the only way to glean any information about her is by viewing the episodes. They are available on, on DVD and also online. This is one of her exchanges with the district attorney, which reminds you of just how novel and lonely it must have been to be a woman doing business in the precinct. Good morning. Hi. Joyce. Uh, can I talk to you? 30 seconds. Don't worry. It's not going to be a protest of my undying love. Could you file these under Clarence Monroe? Joyce, I just want to say what happened on Tuesday. As far as I'm concerned, it happened. It's in a time capsule. All right. Because I want us to keep working together well. And we can't if you think I'm looking at you weird, which I'm not going to be. Deal. No weird looks. Time capsule. What have you got on Clarence Monroe? How did you get so lucky? Oof. What a scum. He takes a C felony and a nickel, or we go to trial. Five years, or when he hasn't been arrested since 84. Okay, we go to trial, Mr. DA. Mr. Tough Guy. Joyce is definitely considered an influential leader among the public defenders. She's a member of the union's negotiating team in season seven, the last season, when the public defenders go on strike. That episode provides a glimpse of what she finds satisfying from her work. And what about a humane pay scale, cost of living adjustments, decent medical coverage? Are any of these things unreasonable? Huh? No. Well, then, let's get them. The city is on its knees. Let's take our best shot. Vote to keep the strike alive. Yeah. We went on strike because the city made it impossible for us to give our clients adequate representation. Under this proposal, the jobs would be restored. You like handling a caseload of 300? Let her talk. In answer to Miss Green? No, I don't. But to prolong this strike to get additional concessions discredits our integrity. And while we fight on, People who are homeless, unjustly accused of crimes, helpless people will continue to suffer. We got what we asked for, and I am voting to end the strike and go back to work. Here, here. And I urge you to do the same. Yeah. All right, people. Midway through the show's run, Joyce becomes an assistant district attorney, but that new gig doesn't last long. By season six, she's back among the public defenders. And in the following exchange with Judge Wachtel, um, Joyce has slapped him across the face in a previous episode after he insulted her from the bench. She appears in the courtroom as the union vote is taking place and is asked by Wachtel to approach the bench. Excuse me. You know I've got some outstanding business, Miss Davenport. 
Your Honor, I'm not representing this client in business before the court. Oh, please approach. <clears throat> Your Honor, I apologize for my unprofessional conduct at my last appearance before the bench. You hit me with a hell of a right. Mr. Flowers is my client in several other proceedings, Your Honor. We've just worked out an agreement that would be beneficial to all parties. Regardless of my status... You see, I thought I you were playing games in my courtroom, Miss Davenport. I know you felt that way. I assure you that was not my intention. I know I got uh, provocative. That was why. I'm sorry I responded that way. I've had the uh, record revised to grant recess when you requested it yesterday. Subsequent events are, um, hmm, off the record. I appreciate that, Your Honor. That should square you with the bar. You guys back to work? I hope so, Your Honor. You know, Joycey, I look at you and you are beautiful. Hmm. You got a few bucks, but I get the feeling you're just visiting. I have to live here. I assure you, Your Honor, that I'm no visitor. This is my house, too. All right, step back. And here's how else we can think of Joyce Davenport. If she indeed was supposed to be the same age as Hamill, who was born in 1943, making her about 40 when she was appearing in the show, Joyce today would be 72, long retired from her position, whether it be in the public sector or private. In context, she's three years older than Hillary Rodham Clinton is today. Would Joyce have gone into politics? Maybe. Might she have been appointed to a judge's seat somewhere? In the 1980s, actually, seasoned women lawyers were finally being appointed to judicial slots at the county, state, and federal level. And from the way I see it, there's one tip of the hat that NBC owes to Joyce Davenport and her legions of lady lawyer followers. Someone at Law & Order SVU should sign Hamill on to be a cameo judge. You know, the way we look up at the bench and see Patricia Callenberg, Marlo Thomas, or Swoozie Kurtz in robe with gavel? We at Advanced TV History think that that is long overdue. Joyce Davenport and Hill Street Blues stands out as the pinnacle of Veronica Hamill's career. Once the show ended, Hamill went on to appear and direct a handful of made-for-TV movies. Her IMDb page is interesting in that her trivia section is longer than her filmography. And of note, Hamill starred in the last cigarette commercial to appear on TV. It was one minute before midnight on January 1st, 1971. The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson's last commercial, was for Virginia Slims and featured Hamill. The character of Lucy Bates is no less groundbreaking or award-winning. At just over six feet tall, the actress Betty Thomas owned, without question, the role of a uniformed police officer in a hard-scrabble urban environment. Over the course of the series, Officer Bates takes the sergeant's exam and passes. She assumes duty as roll call sergeant twice with a return to motor patrol occurring in seasons five and six. Throughout the show's run, Betty Thomas, as Lucy Bates, provided compassion when it was needed, restored order to a chaotic squad room on many occasions, she held dying victims of all ages in her arms, and was a role model of respect. Thomas is the first to say that only when writers and directors saw her range did they build her character around her. Yes, you'll be a regular player. I, and they gave you a con gave me a contract that said seven out of 13 shows I would be guaranteed in. But I was in every show, in, except one, through the entire seven years of the mm -hmm. show. So it did grow. And uh, what happened was they didn't know if I was going to be good or not, really. They said, we, we didn't know what to expect. We liked your audition, but we, we hadn't seen you do anything. So you mm -hmm. were an unproven entity. As I did more and more on the show, I became more of a proven entity. Did they allow you to do comedy? Not really, although... In a funny way, they did. They gave me a partner. The second year, the first year, at the end of the first year, they in the beginning, I wore high heels, a skirt. I was only in the office. They said, no, no, you'll never go outside. I said, you're making a big mistake here. This woman belongs outside on the street. I don't care about it, what, if it happens in real life or not. This woman belongs there. 
And at that time, women were becoming uh, more and more a part of the, uh, of the police force out on the street. So at the end of that year, they gave me a partner because they were afraid to put me out there by myself. So I took my high heels off. I put uh, r black running shoes on. They looked like cop shoes. And uh, I started wearing black uh, pants, I mean the pants from the, from the police mm -hmm. uniform, pants instead of a skirt. And I got a leather jacket with my number on it. And I said, let me out there. And I got outside and I had a partner. So it was great. And my partner happened to be a person that I had a great rapport with, a guy named Eddie Marinaro. And he and I had this thing about, I, I, I would always badger him, and he would always be badgering me. And that, they did use, if you can call that comedy, that relationship was used definitely. And it helped increase my role, I believe, on the show. Thomas has degrees in art and education. Her path to television comes via waitressing at a Second City club in the early 1980s while also student teaching. And as a waitress, she was able to take a Second City comedy workshop and eventually was invited to join the troupe. Thomas's timing and ownership of the character of Lucy Bates makes her memorable, as does her six-foot height and on-camera ease with actor Ed Marinero. Sergeant Lucy Bates was a good egg. According to an article entitled Women in Law Enforcement, published in 2002, uh, the edition of Discover Policing, in 1987, women made up only 7.6% of law enforcement's workforce. And the FBI goes on to report that in 2011, about 12% of the workforce was women. So it's gone from the mid-80s at 7.6% all the way up to 12%. And you have to wonder whether or not that isn't somewhat due to the fact that we do not see women police officers in uniform on TV in a serious role. So, with women so scarce in the courts and precincts, you might think that there was a certain women's restroom chemistry and conversation that took place between Joyce and Lucy. You know, like Christine Cagney and Mary Beth Lacey had on a regular basis in Cagney and Lacey. Nope. In keeping with the traditional segmentation of blue-collar and white-collar protocol at the time, there was no sisterhood between the public defender and police officer. And that was made no more pronounced than in Lucy Bates's first time testifying in court. It's an interesting look into the lives of working women circa the mid-1980s and starts with this clip. Come on, let's go. I can't. I can't find my memo books. I left them right here before I went to roll call. Some jerk probably thinks he's being cute. Oh, Luce, would you just relax? I'm relaxed. You think you were getting ready to go to Jupiter or something? Yeah. It's no big deal. I know it's no big deal. Mr. Davenport, uh, about this afternoon, is there anything that we should bring with us? Just the arrest report and your memo book. If you need it, property will supply the rest. What you say? You know, this is the first time I'm on the stand. I mean, I've done a lot of preliminaries before. It's just that I've never gone to trial with once. Don't worry. It's really not very different. Now, there will be some people who say that in 1984, women should have been more supportive of each other in the workplace. But this was also a time when they were still proving their own chops among men in their own fields. I got four guys in the alley, you got five. What's that, Einstein? 4.5 guys? Luce, I promise, you're making too much out of this. I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't even get up there. Cases like this, most of the time, they make a deal at the last minute. So I might be going through all this for nothing? That's what I've been trying to tell you. So why do I worry until I have to worry? Exactly. Would you please recount exactly what took place after you witnessed my client's alleged drug purchase? Joe, Officer Coffey and I had just pulled up, and uh, the guy took off down the alley. The guy being? Your client, uh, Clarence Jenkins. Please continue. Well, the other guys, the, the buyers, uh, took off in all different directions. And uh, we went after Jenkins down the alley. And uh, he, he dropped this envelope in a trash can and then kept going. So we finally caught him, and then we got the envelope out of the trash Officer can. Officer Bates, how many people were in the alley when you and Officer Coffey arrived? I think there were four or five. Four or five. Then you don't recall the exact number? Well, it was three months ago. Officer Bates, I'm aware that the details of the situation may have slipped your mind in the time that has lapsed. In fact, given the ephemeral state of your memory, how can you be certain that my client is the person who dropped the envelope into the trash can? Because I saw him do it. 
Then your memory is only selectively flimsy. I'm just telling you what I remember I saw. Prior to the convening of this trial, did you rehearse this testimony with Officer Coffey? No. What if I were to tell you that just ten minutes ago, on this witness stand, while you were being sequestered, Officer Coffey testified that you did, in fact, discuss this case extensively on your way to the courtroom today. Would that change your answer? We talked about it. Then you now admit that you did discuss the case with Officer Coffey. We did discuss it, but... Officer Bates, if two suspects were confined together alone in an interrogation room so that they had ample chance to compare their stories and agree on what they would say before questioning, would you be likely to believe anything they told you? I guess not. I mean... So, Officer Bates, given the fact that this is exactly what you and Officer Coffey did immediately prior to this trial, and given your sporadic lapses of memory concerning the details in this case, and especially given the fact that when questioned a few minutes ago, you did not divulge the entire truth as to the nature of your conversation with Officer Coffey, given all of this, Officer Bates, how can you expect this court to have any faith in anything you've told them today? Because the show largely focused on male characters and a myriad of victims, both women had precious little screen time. Almost none of it was together. So it's impossible to point to any moment of outright support or sisterhood between the two. However, from each woman's carriage and command of their own situations through the series, I'd like to think that Joyce and Lucy respected each other's turf and perhaps modeled for each other skills, sensibilities, or sensitivities that helped the other grow. You took a cheap shot at me this morning. If you have a specific problem, Officer Bates, perhaps we can discuss it. You're damn right I have a specific problem. You manipulated me and made me look like I was lying, and I wasn't lying, and you knew it. Don't blame me because you didn't do your job, Officer. Oh, great. That's perfect. That's your job, is it? To make the truth look like lies? You care about winning, and you don't care who you drag through the mud to do it. Officer Bates, I want you in my office right now. Captain. Now. Now. Talked to Assistant District Attorney Rogers this afternoon for 20 minutes. In his expert opinion, your testimony was shaky, unprofessional, and poorly prepared. I understand it's being your first trial, but all the more reason why you should have been extra careful. She didn't have to make me look like a jerk. She didn't make you look like anything. Again, according to ADA Rogers, her cross examination was competent, no more, no less. The bottom line is that she did her job and you didn't. I think you know that as well as I do. Betty Thomas has gone on to direct TV and movies and won an Emmy directing HBO's show Dream On. Hill Street Blues placed two strong women characters into work environments dominated by men. Brilliant writing and storytelling gave Joyce Davenport and Lucy Bates the opportunity to open doors for women. That actresses Hamill and Thomas seized the day and gave it their all resulted not just in an award-winning beloved series, but also, as we learned from one advanced TV history listener, delivered role models in professions previously untouched by women in TV. Any show created since 1987 that features women in the courtroom or uniformed police women stands on their shoulders. Advanced TV history wants to hear from you. If you've got ideas about themes, women, or shows, shows that you just know make you happy, that bring back great memories, please send it to us at advancedtvherstory, that's all one segment, at gmail.com. Or find us on Twitter or Facebook and send it along that way. This installment of Advanced TV Herstory includes audio from a Season 1 DVD bonus feature and a 1991 interview by Lillian Chauvin with Betty Thomas. And I am delighted that there's a law professor named Joan Horwath at Michigan State University Law School who cares so much about women lawyers on TV. Her article, called Women Defenders on Television, Representing Suspects and the Racial Politics of Retribution, appeared in the Jur Journal of Gender, Race, and Justice in 2000 and can be found online. Also, there's a great article at AmericanBar.org, the American Bar Association's Perspective magazine. The fall issue from 2005 
in which Stephanie Goldberg dissects a long list of women lawyers. It's entitled Women Lawyers on TV, Moving Closer to Reality. Again, Stephanie Goldberg, Perspective Magazine from the American Bar Association. It's good stuff. And also, a thanks goes out to Allison Abrams for proofreading and context discussion. Please spread the word about Advanced TV History, which can be found on iTunes or at the hosting site www.libsyn.com. This script and all others can be found at my website, www.cynthiabemisabrams.com. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. Thanks for listening.